feel ready. So everyone, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you brought us safely to another week and that we are all here gathered together. Um, though we are apart, Lord, you still have allowed us this blessing that we can be together virtually. Uh, please be with the two presenters as they go into the discussion. Help them to uh, speak clearly and to remember um, the things they have studied, Lord, and that your words may be evident and we can see you um, through their presentation. Please be with all of us tonight and help us to get a blessing through your word and help us to um, study more on our own as well so that we can be enlightened by you and all that you do. Bless this discussion that we're about to have and thank you for all you do. In your name I pray, amen. amen. All right, Brandon and Eric, feel free. Eric, you're muted. That's how I like to start a presentation. Muted. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So tonight we are studying, starting with Daniel 11. And as Brendan has been telling me this week, he loves this slide because it's a picture of a bunch of old people that nobody knows who they are. Uh, today we are diving into essentially ancient history. Uh, some of which we you know, some of it which you really have to dive into and look at. Um, but I'm excited, I hope you are too. Um, there are a few principles that we thought there, that, that's kind of interesting around Daniel 11. Um, there's a lot of debate about what is the truest accurate interpretation. Um, I went on Google and just put Daniel 11 interpretation, hit the first five links and all five of them were different. Um, one of them may have been Adventist, one of them, uh, I'm not sure, but probably three out of five of the first links on Google, at least the first 15 to 30 verses are very similar. So even while there is difference, um, this first part that we're covering today is pretty well established, not just in Adventism, but actually in different, different various Christianity denominations. Um, the second note is the pinch and zoom principle. Um, we all have smartphones. So when you're looking at your phone, when you zoom in, you get more detail, but you kind of lose a little bit around the edges. Uh, the same concept I have found is true for Daniel. Um, Daniel 2, we see Babylon. And he keeps going on further and further. Further we go, Babylon gets cut off, but we start getting more detail. Um, so that's one of the principles that I found was interesting. Um, Point number three, it can't be drastically than what we've seen in 2, 7, and 8. Because Daniel builds on itself, it does not make logical sense for it to be consistent until one chapter and then, boom, something totally different. Um, and then a lot of what we have on for tonight is draws from Uriah Smith. Uh, there's some Wikipedia and historical events in there that we pulled from other sources, um, but this is where we chose to draw on because um, he did an excellent job. And this is freely available online. If you just type in um, Daniel Revelation, Uriah Smith, you can get a PDF very easily. Um, another interpretation to this is Tim Rosenberg's, and he actually was at Elmhurst Church on March 27, and he did, I think it was a three-part series. Um, he did a fantastic job, and that's available to those of you who want to see that perspective, which is also very interesting and informative. So starting in verse one. Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mean, even I, stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, that there shall up yet three kings of Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up against all the realm of Greece. Now, we see in verse, verses 1, um, Medes and the Persians, they, they combine together, they take over Babylon, and we can see that in 2.7. Um, so we see here in the first corner, Cyrus. Um, and then we see the four following kings. Uh, Cambyses, Smyrdas, Darius, and if any of you can pronounce this better than me, I apologize. I, English is my second language. Um, and then we see Xerxes, um, who was the wealthiest and probably the best known out of all 
um, of the kings of the time. Any questions in the first two verses? Okay, going on. So we see here in verse two, uh, Xerxes. So we're still talking about the fourth king. Um, one of his famous battles that he's known for losing is the Battle of Thermopylae. Um, huge, fantastic army. It looked unbeatable, but this is the story of the 300 Spartans who held back the hordes of the Persians. So this is actually Xerxes who we're talking about. Um, and he did suffer a defeat and he was betrayed. Um, and then he went back to his own country. Um, and growing up, for some reason, I never connected this back into the Bible until a few years ago. And this is interesting because we look at the Bible, it actually ties back into the story of Esther. We have Xerxes who comes home, throws a feast, uh, calls for Queen Vashti to come and, and, and be there, and she doesn't listen. This is a king who's just lost one of the most major battles of his career, who's gone home with his tail between his feet, and now Queen Vashti, who, especially at that time, women didn't really have social standing, and she refuses an order from the king. Um, and then this is where we go into the story of Esther. This, just to kind of bring it back and tie it in with the Bible. In verse three, and a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with a great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards his four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even from others besides those. Now, what's interesting is when we look at history, we don't go directly from Xerxes to Alexander the Great. There's actually six minor kings in between them, if we look at history. Um, while Daniel 11 is pretty expansive, it's not exhaustive. It doesn't cover every detail and nuance because, let's face it, it's only one well, chapter. Did someone want to say something? Okay. Um, so while it jumps over six minor kings, it goes to Alexander the Great, um, who, as we know, conquered a huge amount of the then known world. Um, it was pretty much all of it at the time. But then he goes back, and we know he exhausted his energies in writing and drunkenness and actually died in 323 BC. Now, going back to the verse, we can see that his kingdom was plucked up and divided towards the four winds of heavens. Well, these four winds of heavens we understand to be his four generals, not his children, Cassander, Lysimus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Um, these are the four generals who actually ended up splitting his kingdom. And here we have a map of the four regions. Um, so we see Seleucus, Seleucus, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, took the biggest portion of it. And then Ptolemy, we see in the south by Egypt, uh, by Simeus and Cassander, smaller regions on the left. And this also goes back to Daniel chapter 7, where we see the four heads of the leopard. Um, and then Daniel chapter 8, uh, referring to the four horns. Um, the first horn being Alexander of Greece, who overthrew the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, and then the other four horns that spring up after him and divide uh, the kingdom between them. So at this point, when we look at the rest of the chapter, we will see references to king of the north and king of the south. It's just north against south and north against south, uh, essentially. Um, so we see here in, the, in verse 5, and the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, he shall be strong above him and have dominion, and his dominion shall be great. Um, well, we, we have the four generals so far. Um, and eventually, mm -hmm. actually, oh, sorry, I went backwards. Verse five. I went back to verse four again. 
And the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion. And his dominion shall be a great dominion. So this is where we see them from the north and south. Um, and as you can assume, and as we know from history, they didn't just maintain the status quo. They started conquering one another. So we see Lysimus conquers Cassander. So Greece and Macedonia was annexed to Thrace, um, which then Lysimus was annexed and conquered by Seleucus, which then we see Seleucus and Ptolemy, and these two are the main characters in this part that are constantly at battle one with another. Um, and we see Seleucus in the north. Um, a, and I have here Jerusalem, you'll see in the circle with arrows. So Jerusalem is the center portion because, well, this was written to Daniel um, and Jerusalem had a very high standing for all Jews at the time. Um, so it makes sense for a prophecy given to Jews about future to have a central midpoint as Jerusalem or the kingdom of Israel. Um, so even when we look on here further to the west, this is all still referred to as the kingdom of the north because in battle they would still have to come down around Arabia to battle with Egypt. Um, so any power, because now this land will start to shift north and south and the kings will change. Um, so if it's north of Jerusalem or even to the side, it's the north, if it's Egypt and below, it's the south. Um, and we see here again, uh, this is just a pie chart, again, describing the same thing. Ptolemy had king of the south in Egypt, had only about 25% of the land, and Seleucus in the north had the majority of it. So going to verse six now. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. Um, so there was constant small skirmishes between the king of the north and king of the south. Um, but we see in this case, the case of Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second king of Egypt and Antiochus Theo, the third king of Syria, uh, they agreed to peace because peace is better than war um, on one condition that Antiochus should put away his first wife, Laodice, and her two sons, and should marry the Bernice, the daughter of Ptolemy. Now, Ptolemy brought his daughter to Antiochus in the north and gave a huge dowry along with it. Um, and then in verse six, continuing on, but she shall not remain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm, but she shall be given up that they brought her and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. And here you have a picture of what, what is thought of Bernice could have looked like. Um, the issue with Bernice was that she lost her interest in power with Antiochus. So he, he brought her up. Um, it was okay for a little while, but he put Bernice to the side. He, he wasn't really interested. And he brought back his first wife, Leodice, and her children. Now, if we look at verse seven, or continuing verse six, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but he shall be given up that they shall be brought her and they that begat her and that strengthened her in these times. We see here that Laodice brought back into favor, um, decided that she does not ever want to go through this again and decided that the only way she could guarantee she would never be disgraced again is to kill her husband. So Laodice murdered, had her husband murdered, and she decided that that wasn't enough because she didn't want in the future um, Bernice to challenge their children to challenge for the, the throne of the kingdom. Um, and then at the end of time, we see, but she had given up and they brought her and she began her and that strengthened her in times. So Laodice decided not just to kill her husband and Bernice and Bernice's children, but actually every single assistance and help her um, that brought her up um, servants. So everyone that came up with Bernice from Egypt was slaughtered. Um, and I bring up this story just to say that if the prophecy in Daniel is so detailed to such a specific story, um, that's 
truthfully random and lost of history for the most part. How, how amazing is the rest of the chapter down the road? Um, and so just to take a quick detail, detour, what me and Brendan have put together here isn't exhaustive. So there's more information. Um, so actually, if anyone is interested, I recommend you look into it. Um, but we, we try to do the best we could to fit in in this time period. So because there's so much, I'm gonna read it and just give you a quick nuanced snippet of what's happening at that time. So in verse seven, but out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north and shall deal against them and shall prevail. He shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes, with their precious vessels of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. So here we see verses seven to nine, it talks about the Ptolemy Eugenius, the third pharaoh of the Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt from 246 to 222 BC. Uh, going to verse 10, but his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. In verse 10, it's talking about Sir Lucas II, who was the ruler of the Hellenistic Empire from 246 to 225 BC. Uh, then going on to verse 11 to 12, and the king of the south shall be moved with call and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up and he shall cast down many 10,000s, but he shall not be strengthened by it. Um, this is referring to the Ptolemy, the fourth, the son of Ptolemy III and Bernice, which was the fourth pharaoh of the Ptolemy dynasty from 221 to 204 BC. Now, verse 13, for the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and much riches. Uh, this is referring to Antiochus III, the great, the Hellenistic king and the sixth ruler of the Seleucid Empire. He ruled over Syria and large parts of Western Asia towards the end of the third century BC. Um, and then Ptolemy V and the son of his siblings, Ptolemy, was the fifth ruler of the dynasty from July, August, 204, September, 180 BC. Uh, Ptolemy, who inherited the throne at the age of five when his parents died under suspicious circumstances. Uh, and now we see here in verse 14, and in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south, and the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Um, so here we see Agathos, who that is the coin I found in Philip of Macedon, a rendering of what he could have looked like. Now, verse 14, which we just read, um, Agathos was the prime minister and having possession of the king's affairs and the kingdoms, he was relatively powerful. Um, and he was kind of proud of that. Um, a lot of the provinces of Egypt were subject to him, but Egypt actually rebelled. Uh, Egypt was disturbed to sedition. So in this north, the king of the north controlled the king of the south. The king of the south rebelled against the king of the north. Um, and because of that, uh, Agathos caused um, the Alexandrians, or Egyptians, who rose up against Alexander, caused him and his sister, his mother, and associates to be put to death. Now, verse 15 says, so the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people nor shall there be any strength to withstand. So Philip of Machedon, uh, the picture who we saw right here on the bottom, um, entered into league with Antiochus and divided the dominions of Ptolemy between themselves, each proposing to take the parts that lay closer than geographically and which was also most convenient. Um, here was the rising up of the king of the south sufficient to fulfill the, possibility, the prophecy and it resulted in the events told in verse 15. Now verse 16 is interesting. It actually talks about artisobolus. Um, 
And it's interesting because he himself was a patron of the Sadducees and he brought their cause before the queen. Um, the queen at this time had many fortresses and she placed them at the disposal of the Sadducees to defend against the Pharisees. So what we see, at least the, um, what you learn about the Pharisees versus the Sadducees in the Bible is they butted heads a lot harder than is generally thought of. Um, and he consulted in reality with one of the preparatory moves, again, Artibolus, who we spoke about in verse 14, for the assertion of the government. The queen sought to direct his military zeal outside of Judea and sent him against Ptolemy, king of the south. But when the undertaking failed, Artibolus resumed his political intrigue. He left Jerusalem secretly and he took himself to his friend, who controlled a large number of fortified palaces at that time with the intention of making war against his aged mother. But the queen actually died at the time in a very critical moment, and he turned his weapons against his brother, Hycranesis, who was actually the legitimate heir of the throne. Um, so in verse 16, but he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. None shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land by which his hand shall be consumed. And then we have verse 17. Uh, all right. So um, at this point, uh, he shall enter his face. Uh, he shall set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side and neither before him. So at this point, we have the famous Julius Caesar entering the scene. Um, he famously marched on Rome. Uh, when the Senate tried to take away his armies. Uh, that's where the phrase crossing the Rubicon, uh, Rubi yeah, Rubicon comes from, which is the river outside of Rome. It was illegal to cross that river with an army. And he did so, uh, which started a civil war between him and the Senate. And the Senate's main general was Pompey the Great. So after a decisive defeat, Pompey flees to Egypt and Julius chases him there. So that's where we see him uh, entering with the strength of his whole kingdom, chasing Pompey. So Pompey flees to Egypt and is murdered by Ptolemy uh, the 13th of Egypt, who is the brother and husband and co-ruler with Cleopatra, um, the famous Cleopatra. So Julius, upset over Pompey's death, took control of Egypt. He was furious that uh, a foreigner had killed a Roman general. And so he declared uh, Egypt a part of Rome uh, and uh, took over the, the area. So there was then, of course, Cleopatra and uh, Ptolemy both had claims to the throne and Julius was gonna have to choose between the two. And Cleopatra uh, disguised herself. She rolled herself up in a carpet and had her delivered to Caesar as a gift. So when Caesar unrolled the carpet, there was suddenly Cleopatra. And no one knows what happened in that conversation, but the end result was Julius sided with Cleopatra. So her brother rebelled, started a civil war uh, in Egypt, and Julius fought on the side to give Cleopatra the throne. So on his way to fight, the uh for cleopatra uh we see uh this bit here um and this is from uriah smith antipater the edu how do you say it edu you mean join him with three thousand jews the jews who held the frontier gateways into egypt permitted the roman army to pass without interruption the arrival of this army of jews under antipater helped decide the contest a decisive battle was fought near the nile by the fleets of Egypt and Rome, resulting in a complete victory for Caesar. Ptolemy attempting to escape was drowned in the river. Alexandria and all Egypt then submitted to the victor, Julius and Cleopatra. Rome had now entered into and absorbed the entire original kingdom of the South. So uh, if we go back to verse um, 17, take me back up there, Eric. Yeah, so we see he entered with the strength of his whole kingdom into Egypt. Uh, the Jews, the upright ones, helped him, and uh, he was given the daughter of woman, Cleopatra, 
uh, corrupting her. Um, but she did not stand on his side. Spoiler. Uh, take me back down, Eric. One more slide. Yeah, okay, there we go. Oh, it was right there. My bad. So yeah, what I just explained right here on this slide. Um, all right, one more slide. All right, so the famous line, I came, I saw, I conquered uh, by Julius Caesar. I don't know why that says Alexander the Great. Ignore that. That is by Julius Caesar. <laughs> After this, shall he turn his face into the isles and shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. So following his uh, victory in Egypt, uh, he was drawn away to a war in Syria and Asia Minor against the, how do you pronounce that? Prudel? No, that part. Pharnaces? I think so, Pharnaces. Um, and other kingdoms. Um, so he, uh, absolute victory over them, completely decimated them, took over the whole territory. And he uh, wrote to a friend, Vini Vidi Viki, I came, I saw, I conquered. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So I just mentioned, this was all after the civil war uh, that he started against Rome. He fought, uh, I think, three major Roman families. Uh, and once he was done, he came home and essentially became dictator of Rome, uh, ending the Senate. The Senate existed, but it had no more power. Um, so he returned to the fort of his own land, the city of Rome, and became a dictator. But uh, on the Ides of March, uh, Caesar was assassinated by many of his friends and those he held close to his heart. Um, the famous line, et tu Brute, Andrew Brutus, one of his best friends, uh, as he was slain on the Senate steps. Um, and that was in 44 BC. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. Within a few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. So this is Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. Uh, he is not the son of Julius Caesar, but his nephew. And so he took on the name Caesar, uh, stood up in his estate, and famously raised the taxes. And he began what's known as the Pax Romana, which means peace of Rome. Uh, essentially, during his rule and for some time after, Rome was in a very peaceful situation. Battles were more skirmishes, uh, just defending uh, the borders. Expansion was in a more peaceable format. Um, it was a very... Uh, it, it was considered the golden age of Rome. That's a good way to phrase it. Um, and famously, he did not die in battle, but died peacefully. And, and this is really important here. So Augustus is a raiser of taxes. And sure enough, in Luke 2.1, it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. This tax is the reason why Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem. Um, this was the birth of Jesus. And so verse 20 puts us right here at the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, next slide. And again, uh, he died peacefully in his bed at Nola um, at the age of, uh, yeah, 76th year of his age, AD 14. He died peacefully in his sleep. Um, so he, he ruled uh, very successfully in a, in a very stable manner. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not honor or give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So this is Tiberius Caesar, the man who followed Augustus on the Roman throne. Uh, he was raised to the consulate, which is a uh, the leadership position of Rome at the age of 29. This uh, is recorded that uh, Augustus was, uh, he, Augustus actually wanted to nominate multiple different people to his successor. Um, and the one he finally chose actually died. And so he was in a hurry to nominate the next person. And his wife had been pushing him to nominate Tiberius, her son from a former husband. 
Um, and he had famously said, your son is too vile to wear the purple of Rome. So that word vile, exactly as we see in the verse, which is pretty awesome fulfillment. Um, so he wanted to nominate Agrippa, but Agrippa died and thus it went to Tiberius. Uh, so Tiberius was largely absent. He actually built an island home and just lived there most of the time um, and left the running of the state to others. Uh, he was not very well liked through Rome, especially in the leadership since uh, essentially he did not care for maintaining control or stability. Um, he just did whatever he wanted. Um, and his successor Caligula was just as bad at that. Um, and uh, Eric, did you want to talk what you looked up about Tiberius? So I actually looked up Tiberius just on Google to find out what, what made him so vile. Why, why does the Bible say he was vile? Why did the Caesar before him say he was vile? Um, and he, he actually was very vile. Um, like um, mutilation of people, um, vile, like sexual mutilation, um, things that we actually would be banned on uh, on internet today. Uh, it'd be one of those things that are content. Um, so he was a very disturbed individual. Um, and, and if anyone wants to look it up, you can find the information very easily. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, so with the arms of a flood, they shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Uh, a more accurate translation uh, from Thomas Newton kind of presents it more as the arms of the overflower shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken. The idea being that this is talking about the death of Tiberius. Um, so uh, acting as the hypocrite to the last, he disguised his increasing debility. Uh, his mental state was deteriorating and his physical state too, as much as he was able, even affecting to join in the sports and exercises of the soldiers of his guard. At length, leaving his favorite island, the scene of the most disgusting debaucheries, he stopped at a country house near a promontory of Massium, where on the 16th of March, 37, he sunk into a lethargy in which he appeared dead. And Caligula, his heir, was preparing with a numerous escort to take possession of the empire when his sudden revival threw them into consternation. At this critical instant, Macro, the Praetorian prefect, caused him to be suffocated with pillows. Thus expired the Emperor Tiberius in the 78th year of his age, 23rd of his reign, uh, universally uh, execrated. What's that mean? Execrated? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Universally hated, that's for sure. Um, so he died violently. But there's another part to that verse. It says, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Jesus Christ is the prince of the new covenant. Uh, when we, if you remember from my study on the 2300 days, the old and new covenants, Jesus is the prince of the new covenant. Um, and sure enough, Jesus Christ dies during the reign of Tiberius. His whole ministry takes place during the reign of Tiberius. Um, you can see that in Luke 3, 1 through 3. Um, if somebody wants to, to go ahead and, and read Luke 3, 1 through 3. I can read it. Verses 1 through 3. Okay. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all country, into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So right on time, as given by Daniel 11, Tiberius uh, is emperor and dies, and so does Jesus Christ. Um, an amazing fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, I want to point out something here. There is a large, uh, I, I, would, I would say probably the majority of, of Christianity 
thinks Daniel 11 is talking primarily about a man named Antiochus Epiphanes of Greece. And I think this proves out a shadow of a doubt that is impossible. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes has died well before Rome comes on the scene. And here in verse 22, we're barely halfway through the chapter. We already have the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Um, so it cannot be Antiochus Epiphanes that goes through the rest of this chapter. It must be talking about uh, other superpowers, uh, powers that we've already mentioned in chapters two, seven, and eight. So I just want to put that on the record. So after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with the small people. So at this point, uh, Uriah Smith has these verses going a little bit back in history, not far back, just a little bit. Um, he, he, in this, he believes, is the league made between the Jews and the Romans in 161 BC. Um, this league uh, allowed the Romans with the aid of the Jews, to uh, unite against the kings of Syria and uh, take them down um, and become strong with the small people. So me and Brendan actually went ahead and we found the, um, the contract between Rome and Israel. And, and just reading it, the decree, friendship with the nations of the Jews, if we make war with the Jews and we'll assist them, by sending corn or ships or money. And if you attack them, the Romans will assist. And if the Romans are attacked, then the Jews shall assist. And just and keeping on going. And this reminded me very much of the treaties of World War I and World War II in modern history, where if you look at it, yes, we help each other. And if you go against them, then we come in. Um, so I have no historical evidence for this, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if this functioned as one of the templates for more modern style treaties between countries. <laughs> All right. uh, he shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the provinces, a province. He shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, and riches, yea, and he shall forecast the devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Um, so before the days of Rome, most conquest was done primarily and almost exclusively through war. Uh, Rome was kind of one of the first ones to bring about uh, treaties and uh, agreements and wheeling and dealing uh, where they typically benefited and were able to expand their territory uh, through those means. Um, and when we remember Daniel chapter seven, Rome was described as this undefinable beast who would crush and break apart uh, everything beneath it. And so we see here that Rome would do what no one else had done before with their father's fathers, uh, and they shall scatter the prey and spoil and riches um, forecast devices against strongholds. So all the conquering, all the all the uh, territory expansion, all of that here is adequately de uh, described in verse 24. And like I said, we had gone back in time. So uh, verse 25, and he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand for they shall forecast devices against them. Oh, and just to note, in King James, devices essentially means strategies, stratagems, um, plans and plots, things like that. Um, so uh, we jump back to uh, 161 BC, um, and this is talking about that fight between uh, Julius Caesar and the armies of Egypt, particularly after uh, Antony betrays Julius Caesar. So Antony was one of Julius Caesar's good friends. Pretty much every enemy of Julius Caesar was a good friend. And Antony betrays him uh, when he started the civil war and goes to Egypt uh, and unites with Cleopatra. Cleopatra betrays Julius Caesar to unite with Antony. And together, Antony and Cleopatra controlling Egypt uh, attack um, 
not Ju uh, Julius this time, but his heir, Octavian. So Octavian is Augustus's original name. So remember, Julius Caesar went to Augustus Caesar, and his Augustus's original name was Octavian. Um, if you're noticing, Julius, July, uh, August, Augustus, October, Octavian, yes, all our months are named after Roman emperors. Um, so the Battle of Actium was this big conflict in the Navy between Octavian and Mark Antony. Um, and uh, next slide. They, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down. So in this fight, Antony was deserted by his allies and friends and those that fed of the portion of his meat. Uh, so all those that, that worked with him, ate with him, they betrayed him. And Cleopatra, who had, remember, betrayed Julius to fight against Octavian and work with Antony, uh, withdrew from the battle, taking her ships with her, which was a pretty large army. Uh, and the land army, disgusted with the infatuation of Antony, over August, uh, went over to Augustus, who received the soldiers with open arms. So Antony was left essentially all alone. Everyone betrayed him. Um, so when Antony arrived in uh, fleet and he arrived in Libya, he found the forces he had left there under Scarpus uh, to guard the frontier had declared for Augustus now, his name changed to Augustus, and in Egypt his forces surrendered. So Antony took his own life. Um, so uh, both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. Yet the end, of, uh, yet the end shall be at the time appointed. So again, Uri Smith goes a little bit back in time before the battle of Actium between Octavian and Antony, and talks about how they were previously in alliance after Julius's death. Um, they acted like they were friends, but they were both aspiring and intriguing for universal dominion. Both knew that with Julius Caesar, the, um, uh, the Republic had now become an empire, and both sought to take control of this new empire. So uh, their friendship for each other was uh, full of hypocrisy. They spoke lies to each other constantly. Um, Octavia, the wife of Antony and sister of... Um, Augustus. Augustus. Oh, second. Uh, Octavia, as opposed to Octavian, sorry. So Octavia, the wife of Antony, sister of Augustus, declared to the people of Rome at the time Antony divorced her that she had consented to marry him solely with the hope they would prove a pledge of union between uh, Augustus and Antony. But that council did not prosper. The rupture came, and in the conflict that ensued, Augustus was entirely victorious, which we just talked about the Battle of Actium. Um, so next slide. Then uh, he shall he return unto his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits to return to his own land. So after his victories in Egypt uh, against Antony, uh, Augustus now, um, were able to bring back all these riches and uh, uh, prizes from Egypt. So if you remember back to the beginning, Eric showed us that, you know, the king of the north was 75% and the king of the south was 25% of, Augusta, of uh, Alexander's empire. And the reason the south was able to hold its own with so much less territory is how rich Egypt is and or was as a nation. And so with Egypt completely under Roman rule now, there was no kind of puppet state with any kind of Ptolemy left. All the Ptolemies were gone. Um, Augustus was able to bring back tons and tons and tons of gold and money and essentially all the treasure that Egypt had gathered throughout its many, many centuries of being world power. And that was so much money, it actually broke uh, the Roman economy for a bit. Uh, prices crashed, gold plummeted in value. Um, it was that much money. Okay, so... At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but shall not be as the former or as the latter. So at this point, Rome is now the power that controls the Mediterranean. Whole uh, gambit from Spain to throughout North Africa, Rome controls it. So there's not really any king in the south. So what does it mean here when he'll come toward the south, not as the former as the latter? Well, every time the king of the north has come to the south, it's been about war. So this is going to be different. In 33 AD, 
the uh, a new emperor, Constantine, moves the capital from Rome to Constantinople. Now, that's just a move from uh, west to east, Italy to uh, Greece, Turkey area. I forget which side of the, the strait it's on, but one of those two. Um, and in doing so, while that's moving west to east, it's also moving towards Jerusalem, which is toward that south, because you have to go around the Mediterranean. So that could be an answer for this uh, toward the south. And Constantine's important because we've been talking about for the last day, a few uh, weeks of Daniel, one of the things that's come up is this papacy, Daniel uh, 7 and 8, both heavily highlighted this papal power who would show up and persecute God's people. Well, that starts with Constantine. Constantine was the first Christian emperor. He converts at a battle famously. He was shown a sign in heaven, said, if you fight under this sign, you'll be granted victory. And that sign was a Cairo, the Catholic Cairo sign. So he painted it on the shields, converted his army to Christianity, and won the battle. And with that battle, that was reunifying the empire after it had been divided. So with a now reunified empire under a Christian leader, he had to change the entire pagan priest system of Rome into a Christian priest system. Uh, and that Christian priest system of Rome is what we know as the papacy today. Uh, and it would last uh, till today, actually, and is still continuing on. So next slide. For ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So Chittim here is, uh, you can look this up in, in a strong concordance. It means islanders, essentially. Well, in uh, four, uh, well, in 440s, I believe, uh, the Vandals, these were a group of um, raiders in the seas from North Africa. Uh, Western Rome, after the move to Constantinople, had started to degrade, especially the Italian France area had started to, uh, it lost support from the Eastern Empire. Uh, all the money was in Egypt, so it couldn't really support itself. Um, and as the defenses fell, eventually these Vandal ships came sailing all through the Mediterranean, destroyed Rome's stranglehold on the Mediterranean Sea, destroying its economy, and actually sacking Rome. Vandals is where we get the word vandalized uh, from their seven, I think it was a seven-day sacking of Rome. Uh, famously, they didn't kill that many people, but they destroyed much of the city, uh, took anything they could carry, and anything that they couldn't carry, they just destroyed, um, leaving the city in shambles. And this, this occupation of the Mediterranean Sea by the Vandals is considered to be what led to the eventual fall of the Roman Empire in 476, when it was conquered by the Ostrogoths and was declared the, no, Visigoths, sorry, and declared the Visigoth Kingdom. Um, and there would no, be no more Roman emperors. So these ships of Chittim caused him to be grieved. That's the fall of Western Rome. In return, it had indignation as the Holy Covenant. So Rome changes strategy here, and we see what was left of Rome. Uh, the Eastern Empire, uh, the King Justinian, gave the papacy uh, dominion over Western Rome. And the papacy, in order to kind of reunite Rome or, or bring power back, needs to get his own army. But he doesn't have his own authority to do it. So what he does is he goes to pagan generals uh, pagan, other pagan leaders. And by compromising on Christianity to accept these pagan leaders, he converts them and uses their armies to attack his enemies. The first instance of this would be Clovis the Hammer of the Franks, who converts to Christianity and proceeds to fight the Pope's battles for him. So we see not only does the papacy begin to institute its uh, false doctrines against the Holy Covenant, but it has intelligences with these pagan kings that have forsaken the Holy Covenant in order to gain power. And this brings us to, uh, you know, in Daniel 7 and 8, this, this little horn power that shows up. Um, so again, as Eric pointed out, we don't separate much from Daniel 7 and 8. We're actually telling the same story, just with much more detail um, and not Antioch's epiphanies. And that is where we're going to stop here. Uh, I know we're just about to get to the exciting part, um, but I promise next week, uh, 
Eric's come up with some very uh, fun, fun ideas for these verses, and I think everybody will have a good time. <laughs> I just wanted to highlight one more thing. Going back to the vandals from the previous one and the sacking of Rome, if you look at historical context, just put a little more color. Um, while the vandals sacked Rome and took a big brunt of it, um, history shows us that the vandals went as far north as Ireland, even. Um, and this actually is what led to the white slave trade of Africa at the time. Um, it, it's said historically that especially villages and towns by the river, by the oceans in the Mediterranean, um, they would just disappear overnight. They would come at night and just take entire towns and put them into the slave trades. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in because I thought it was a very interesting historical note. Catherine, you were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to open it up for questions for everyone. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. If you guys are ready. Could I make a comment? Yeah, I'd like you to please repeat what you just said about um, overnight. Who was... Oh, sure. Who? So going back, let me go back to the verse 30, um, where it talks about the ships of the Chittim. Um, we can see, looking at history, we see that... Well, Rome took a big brunt of the uh, looting and vandalism, um, that the vandals even went as far north as Ireland. Um, and it said that, especially towns that were by the seashore, um, they would disappear at night. They would just come and take everyone and put them into slavery. Now, who would put who in slavery? So the vandals or the Northern African tribes would go and, and attack Rome in that area. Um, they would just citizens, anyone, entire towns. Hmm. I'm gonna have to look that up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, somebody had their hand raised. It was um, Janice. I'm sorry, I'm probably not saying that correctly. Um, oh, you're, you're muted. Hold on, let me unmute you. Um, I can't unmute you. There you go. <clears throat> go ahead. Yes, nice to see you. You have made a very good uh, historical explanation. Every uh, Eric and uh, Bratson, Brandon, very, very good. This is our classical explanation. Is here brother Pastor Piroski maybe with us? Because mm -hmm. I I'm I can speak uh, Croatian and he will translate it. Is it possible? Okay, let's try. Let's try. Go ahead, let's try. Can you hear me? Oh yes, I hear you. Okay. okay. You know, Go ahead, let's Moje pitanje je sljedeće. Tako, ja spoznam to, ja sam to, kako bi rekao, 20 godina proučavao, reci mi, i našao sam... Let me translate. Okay, let me translate. My question is following. I studied the subject for the last 20 years, and I found out... Yes, I found that... I came to the, uh, the, 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 uh, ah, yeah. I only sam došao do istoga povijesnog trenutka kad je papsto nastupilo. And I came to the same, uh, the same historical moment when the papacy came. Tako da smo tu potpuno zajedno. And we are together in this one. Yes. Moje pitanje je jedno drugo. Kad je Erik lijepo pokazao severni i južni kralj, severni i južni kralj, mi moramo ostati tamo i ne umešati Rim, pošto je Rim zapadni kralj. Ok. When it comes, he said, I agree with everything. When it comes to the kingdom of north and the south, we had to take the rim uh, from 
Roman Empire out because the Roman Empire is, what did you see? He said, uh, southern and northern king, they begin to the third king, which is a Greek kingdom. Yes. Sorry, only prepared. Четвърто царство има десет рогова и мали рог. Fourth kingdom had ten horns and a little horn. Tako. To je prlo važno. That is extremely important. Mi ne smemo izaći iz te gabarito. To so neki gabariti, takle, seven južni kralj pripadaju trećem carstvu, a mali rok i deset rogova pripadaju četvrtom carstvu ili Rimu. So, so again, he is repeating that the, uh, 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 the king of the north and king of the south, they belong to the third kingdom and the Ten horns and a little horn, they belong to the four kingdom. Yes, zelo dobro. Dobre, mi se stražimo s tim. Gde ste zakaj? To nam bo jako važno, kad budemo došli na Daniel 11, 40 do 45. He said that this is very important when we come next week to Daniel Chapter 11, verses 40-45. Yes. Evo, toliko samo. To je jedna moja, ozbiljna, ne samo moja, ja ozbiljna primetba tomačenju Urija Šmitu. Ja mu dam kapu dole, s obzirom kako je on kao prvi naš tomač sve to skupio. Ali to ne znači da je on sve do kraja točno Biblijski nam podal. Ok. Ja, very good. Ok, ok. He appreciate very much the presentation and everything he said. He's looking forward to see how it's going to be. Uh, uh, I'm not <laughs> paraphrasing what he said, uh, but uh, what is going to be, how it's going to be presented next year. He said da. that this is extremely important. Da, da. Hoće mi to reći da i Urija Žmit koji je, koji je nam dao prvu knjigu Daniel i otkrivenje i on je i napravio veliki, veliki posao. Ali Elena White nigde ne rekla, on je točno, točno, točno rekao kako je. Mnogo istraživanje će nam malo pomagati da malo to, kako bi rekao, malo ridimenzioniramo. Evo toliko. He said that uh, Urias did what uh, most he he gave the uh, he gave he was one of the first who gave explanation, but he cannot apparently say that he was right absolutely right about the interpretation of this subject. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, for uh, your efforts to to. Mm. Give to the brothers and sisters. I am a pastor. I have a man. I made a very big study, too much, too much study of Daniel. About twenty-five different books, you know. In the one brother, Pellegrini from Italy, he made a two thousand page of Daniel in Revelation. And I have this opportunity to, to understand his, his understanding, you know. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, okay. I just want to move us along. We had, sorry, we had a question. Um, next one, hand raised, was from BJ, or from Bruce. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, my, my question was for Brandon or for Eric or whoever can answer it. And I was looking through my notes on this chapter because I've studied this chapter. Just a quick question if you have an answer. Looking at verse 30, it says, um, and they had indignation against the holy covenant and so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Now, the question I have, this I put this down in my notes. You just tell me if you agree or if this is your understanding. I had down here that Constantine, he signed the Sunday law, 321. We all know about that. Is, is this what this is pointing to or alluding to? Was this your thoughts on it also? Because remember, it's talking about that he has intelligence against the Holy Covenant. We know that obviously instituting a Sunday law would be in opposition to the covenant because it's in opposition, obviously, to the law of God. So just on what your thoughts on that would be, Brandon or Eric or whoever wants to answer. Uh, I'll take uh, this one. So um, the, the thing about the papacy that's interesting is it is formed under Constantine. That's correct, as I mentioned. Um, but it, it doesn't really have political power under Constantine because it's still under the emperor. And the emperor is the head of the church, essentially of Rome at that time. Um, it's only once the empire is destroyed that the papacy can kind of rise above politics. And that's what we see uh, after the fall of Rome. But then when the, I said, Clovis of the Franks, King of the Franks, he agrees to work for the papacy and for the papacy conquers others. And now the papacy is above the kings. And so I think that's what that verse 30 is talking about is, is we'll talk about it next week with the removal of the daily, but it's talking about that. This intelligence is, is, is like this, agreement this conversation he's having with those who forsake the holy covenant so these these foreign kings who aren't christian but he nominally converts them to christianity to to have this intelligence to have this agreement with them to fight for him so so i i think you're on the kind of, uh, we, we kind of agree in principle i would just put it later because then it sets us up for 31 through 36 which we'll see as well further that 31 probably 39 um, talking about the papacy uh, in, in the dark ages of Europe. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, so just, just to be clear, when you hear when it says and have indignation against the Holy Covenant, you're saying that this is Clovis of the Franks? or did the, No, the, that's who he's having intelligence with is Clovis of the Franks. It is the papacy having indignation against the Holy Covenant. And then he has intelligence with others. That's the Clovis that he's having intelligence with others. Does that make sense? Yeah, just, just keep in mind where it says, it says now, it says, the, the last portion of it just says, and them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So to forsake something means that at one point you was a part of it, or you believed in it, or you accepted it, but now you're you're abandoning or rejecting it. Okay, that's just what it says at the end, so. It does. You're, you're not wrong. Um, many of those Germanic tribes do have Christian parts of them. Um, even though they were pagan with rituals, they still had Christianity in them more so than I would say the emperors of Rome who were mm -hmm. never truly converted ever were using it purely for political reasons. So they never forsook it. They just never had it. I will point out though, this is just my personal theory right. that I've been playing with. Um, but we see here this indignation against the covenant. And right. actually, if we go back a few verses. So um, that's 30 to which one? Go back to, where is it? Uh, It says something about the same thing earlier, just a, a few verses before. Oh, oh, there about, it is, verse 28. Oh, okay. Verse 28, then he shall return into his own land with great riches, and he shall be against the Holy Covenant and shall do exploits to return to his own land. So I'm wondering, so I, I we followed Jerry Smith because he had a very clear, very detailed explanation, and right. we're not historians. But I kind of wonder personally if this preamble of against the holy covenant is actually constantine setting up the papacy and then you know it disappears for the ships of chittim when the vandals happen and then re-emerges at the end of verse 30. right uh, so so to me again just to follow up on your point where it says against the holy covenant there has to be something deliberate and prominent that happens and we know what constantine did he signed that law yeah and that changed the whole dynamics of everything in the kingdom all kind of things were happening persecution started so forth and so on and then of course it's, we know what it all led to and anyway so you would say it's either 28 or 30 talking about or alluding to 
him invoking that law. Yes. Okay. That, Got that it. would be me. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you. No problem. I have a question, if I may. My name is Monique. Um, my um, good friend Deborah sent me this link to join tonight. I would like to know uh, many people, and I read it. Um, unfortunately, I don't have it in front of me. Believe that Constantine had converted to Christianity, but I read that there was no proof that he was at, had actually turned Christian. He was more concerned with his seat as emperor, and because the Christians, as were you know the Christians and the the pagans, were were fighting, you know. So is it where we can say as Christians, oh, okay, he converted because he stopped the persecution, or is there some other type of proof that he was actually Christian? Other than you know, he he you know, him signing and changing uh, the Sabbath to Sunday and so on. So uh, there is, you know, it's hard to know someone's heart. And even as I, I'm about to say what I say, who knows what he did right before he died? You know, I'm not going to pass judgment on him, uh, especially as his salvation is concerned. But what I will say is after his conversion, um, there was a point at which he was. I, I don't remember if it was another army. He was scared of something. Rome was in, in general scared of something and he ordered, well, he didn't order. He allowed mm -hmm. the, uh, no, he ordered a pagan priest to do some sacrifices on Sunday in order to get as much help as possible. Um, so as much as I, I think certainly elements of Christianity invaded his character, uh, I don't think he was fully converted at all. And, and history shows it was more of a political means than anything. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question is from Archer. He's had his hand raised. Yes. Well, so far, I think the historical background is very accurate and uh, informative. But I would like to make a point of interest, and that is, remember where we're going. We're going to the last verse of Daniel 11, which says, at that time, the given not shall come to his end and not help him. And then the first verse of chapter 12 says, and that that time shall make us stand up. This is the ultimate goal of this chapter. We have the historical background, but trying to place this in our day is the issue. Now the Kevin North has gone through many regimes. There's not one country or one nation that is Kevin North. We keep changing, 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 you know? So it came down to the point where it was pagan Rome, now I move on to papal Rome. The next thing is now after papal Rome, which would be the next world power referred to as King of the North. And the key to it all is who controlled Palestine? Who controls Palestine is the key to the whole thing. So we have to find out now in the last days here, because the key is the King of the North coming to his end, and at that time shall Michael stand up. So I would see next week would be a very intriguing time. First, 25, who is the king of the north in this 2021 that will come to his end and don't help him. And I would like to just introduce this little book here called Words to Little Flock. You may have heard about the book, A Word to the Little Flock. And I'd like our theologians there to read page eight to nine because the theory presented in this book here by Rabbi Ellen G. White and James White is very interesting because it is bringing America into the scene of action. And that's where I want to get to next week. America is a part of this regime in the end time when Michael shall stand up. That's my comment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Archer. We couldn't have done that promo better if we wanted to next week. <laughs> Yes, I have we are just an, 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 an article about Constantine. Iroshki, would you like to translate me? Sedmog Marta ove godine je 1700 godina od kada je Konstantin dao taj nedeljni zakon. John Piroshki? Oh, John is I don't think pastor is here. Yeah, I don't think oh, pastor's here, sorry. Yes. Oh, I will 
Uh, Maybe I can help. Sure. This, you said, uh, neko druge može nam prevoditi na engleski, nema? Uh, Maybe seven... I can help him. Mogu ja pomoći. O, oh, bravo. 7. marta ove godine je točno 1700 godina od kad je dan nedeljni zakon, kad je Konstantin dao taj nedeljni zakon. Uh, 7th of March this year uh, was uh, 1700 years from a uh, uh, moment when Constantine gave this uh, Sunday law. Yes, jedna naša adventistica, vjernica, mlada, je napisala taj članak i je objavljen u časopisu išao je širom celo naše Slovenije. A young Adventist uh, uh, lady, girl, yes. she uh, made a, an article in a newspapers and it was uh, uh, spread it all, through all Slovenia and many people uh, uh, read this article. Yes. Dakle, uh, Još, još, ne, još nešto se dogodilo. Onda sam se ja sjetio da je 16. marta prije 500 godina Luther bio u Wormsu i govorio je o svojoj veri i stao je nepokolebljiv proti celomu carstvu i papstvu. Uh, 500 years ago, on the same date, Luther was standing... Uh, in a worms, uh, yes, in a worms, Germany. Uh, he was on a trial and he was uh, defending uh, a truth against the papacy. Okay. <laughs> to je to što sam htio potjeliti. Dakle, ono što ste vi rekli, dakle, o Konstantinu i taj datum, taj časopis, taj, taj artikel, ta članak, i onda meni pobudio da sam ja to objavio i to su objavili pet različnih časopisa po celi Sloveniji i još na internetu. Yeah, uh, I, I helped uh, to spread this article and uh, five newspapers in Slovenia, they, uh, they helped to spread uh, uh, this article through whole Slovenia and it was also made a uh, uh, special announcement on internet. Okay. No, it's okay. I just, if you want to Okay, send, that's um, all. Thank you. If you want to send the Thank article you. to uh, Pastor Porosky, Pastor John, uh, send him the article and maybe he can send it to us so we can read it later. Yes, I can send it by uh, by okay. John Piroski. Yeah, send it to send it to John Piroski, and then maybe he can send it to us so we can all read the article later. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, next, uh, ha who had their hand raised was uh, Andrew. Um. Yeah. Um. This one's for Brendan. Um. <laughs> um. I actually been doing the same thing with the studying of, and this was after um, Tim, Tim had come to church. And I was, I did this, I asked God to wipe my memory of what he had said so that I could just do my own version of studies. And then I found out the same exact thing he found, except for a few things that might differ. But I'm just wondering what you th think of that. So uh, Tim's study, and, and I compared it to um, this guy, that, that's from Tim's handout. So I had it the whole time, comparing mm -hmm. it between uh, his and Uri Smith. And most of it agrees uh, very much, except for uh, right before Papal Rome. And I actually find this really interesting. So if you remember, I highlighted a part when we went back in time. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we did the crucifixion um, in verse um, 22. And then 23, we went back in time to the lead with the Jews. Alternately, with Tim, he goes forward in time to the Crusades. And, and this is why, after the crucifixion, there is another battle between the king of the north and king of the south, which again, traditionally, Egypt versus uh, 
Rome or Greece. And so after Rome conquers Egypt uh, in Julius's uh, or in Augustus's time, there's no more Egypt to fight with. Egypt is a province of Rome. So the question is, what is this battle? So Uriah Smith goes back in time to just cover that last battle with Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Tim goes forward in time to the papacy in Europe versus uh, Islam in the Crusades. Um, and, and I can see both those points. The problem with, with going, and I don't like going backwards in time. And while Tim does go forward, he then has to go backwards to reestablish the papacy in, uh, at the end of verse uh, 30, where we ended. And so either way, you're having to go backwards at some point. I don't like either of those, to be honest. That's why I was trying to do my own of, is there a way to read Daniel 11 that is chronologically all the way forward? I mean, maybe it might, pre like one verse will mention something in the future, but you're not like jumping ahead or going having to go back and forth in your explanation. Um, there is, there's some civil wars in Rome, such as the Palmian Empire that establishes itself in Egypt. So I, I was trying to put this together, but I didn't have time. So I just ended up sticking with Uriah Smith. But the Palmian Empire is in Egypt. And so maybe that's the king of the north versus king of the south. And when um, Arulian reunifies the empire uh, and fights the Palmian and defeats the Palmian Empire, maybe that's what it's talking about. But I couldn't find any, any battles that mirrors what's in scripture. Um, and then there's also Constantine, who in his time, the empire had been split into four. And he, or four, and he has to go and unite and, and feed three other guys to become emperor. So maybe then, um, I'm not sure. I couldn't really find a way to make it fit. But um, I, I, I think there's something missing here because I don't think we should be jumping around through the chronology to make Daniel 11 work. So it seems pretty forward to me. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I think there's, there's the, the important thing though is that in the, the major points, uh, Uriah Smith and Tim do agree, which is the, the beginning, the crucifixion, and then the rise of the papacy. All that stuff is dead on agreement. And those are the most important parts of, of Daniel 11, from my understanding. Okay. Yeah, that's because I was confused on that. And actually, I agree with you. On, I was actually going to mention that I did, I did agree with you on that um, part, actually, with um, what you had just said. All right. Good. Um, next question was from Boris. He had his hand raised. Yeah, uh, I have some uh, concerns about Uriah Smith, you know, because uh, we know that uh, some of his uh, writings are pretty compromised uh, because uh, uh, we had to make a lot of reductions on this text. So uh, uh, why, are we, why, why don't we use uh, more some newer uh, uh, Adventist uh, authors like uh, Maxwell or Stefanovic, instead Uriah Smith, because I think um, there is a good idea what he uh, uh, he wrote, but uh, all this uh, idea about uh, historical explanations are a little bit uh, uh, questionable, I think, if you understand me. No, you yeah. know, because, okay. Yeah, um, so I, when I, uh, I remember when I first became Adventist, I actually read Maxwell's God Cares One and God Cares Two. Those are like the my big first studies. And as far as Maxwell goes from what I remember of his Daniel 11, he actually didn't have much. It was a lot of maybe this, maybe that, but uncertainty. So that's why I didn't present it. It's not very good for a, a first time look. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of concreteness there. Um, uh, Eric, did you have anything you want to add? So yes, just like I said in the beginning, just looking at the first five hits on Google, um, the historical aspect, even outside of Adventism, just in general Christianity, the big points that Brennan's referring to, there is pretty much general consensus on the history of it. Now, next week, when we get to um, to the second part of Daniel 11, you will see us divert completely away from Uriah Smith. Um, so we, we, we used him as a historical template, and then we checked him against sources. 
Um, but for the second part or next week, we completely split away to uh, two different diversions. Yeah, but you know, uh, the problem is because if we are using compromised uh, uh, sources, and also if we are continuing trying to uh, find uh, uh, these historical traces on that way, we are very close to problem that, uh, that can compromise our statements. There is a reason why uh, theologians, uh, by my colleagues like Maxwell and uh, especially Stefanovic, because I know him personally, uh, they rather used a little bit uh, different explanations about these problems. So I'm not sure what you mean by compromised. Uh, for what me and Eric did, everything that Uriah Smith said, we would double check with a secular source. Uh, we would just go through Wikipedia, check sources, and make sure that everything we said was true. Um, so I'm not sure what you're saying by compromised. That I mean, everything we said was validated elsewhere. Um, we didn't we didn't have anything that that wasn't validated elsewhere. Yeah, but do uh, you know what, what was the problem? Because we know that all what he wrote about uh, prophecies and etc. Uh, mainly, he used this historical uh, uh, viewpoint about uh, Daniel and uh, and and the uh, Revelation. And uh, today's Adventist uh, uh, theologians they made a little bit uh, different approach to this thematic, you know, because uh, he compromised himself in some other part, maybe. Even maybe he made a good point about other, uh, you know, some, 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 some other parts. But for that reason, we must be very, um, how I can say it, um, very uh, cautious about using uh, some sources because we can compromise our statements with with this problem you know you know what I mean of, of course but I mean that's true with any source um, that's why Eric and I used multiple sources we just Rice Smith has the most comprehensive breakdown of verse by verse it was the easiest to check and for this historical part from what I understand most Adventists agree with historical Uri Smith that we've presented up to verse 30 um all the i checked with a few other theologians that i knew from back home in tennessee and they all are like yeah that, that stuff i typically think it's okay it may not be right but it's good enough um i, I know uriah smith has other parts and like i said we're going to diverge completely once we catch up uh to to him in, in the next next week but um i mean just like any other source that you would ever study if it's not scripture um, if it's not inspired writings, then you have to always be cautious. You have to always be careful. Um, you have to test it against the word. You have to test it against history and make sure that, that, um, that it is accurate. Um, but it was, it was the best that me and Eric had. Brothers, I agree fully with all you. And you have on my screen, my mail. You can write me, I will send you in English what we sent three times to the Bible Research uh, Institute, but they didn't answer anyone any time to us. Yeah, I will send you, everybody, you will send me to this uh, mail. This is the, the topic for the next uh, Friday, you know. It will be very interesting. If you will write, you can look this in, in the next, uh, in the next uh, week, we can discuss much about all this. Thank you. Uh, thanks for putting your email on there. Um, we're just going to, for the interest of time, because we're running really short on time, uh, Bruce had his hand raised next. I think he wanted to interject something there. Sorry, yeah, you, know, you, know, you know what, my, my sister, thank you very much. I'm, I'm just going to talk about the issue of compromise, but I don't want to say anything harsh, so I'll just pass on this. Okay, I don't want to talk oh. about the compromise. Oh, okay. Thank, thank you. I'll, I'll just pass on the question. Thank you. Okay, then if not, Archer, did you want to say something? Oh, sorry, you're muted. Let's unmute you. Uh, who will be the who will be the teacher next week? Next um, week? again, it'll be Brandon and Eric. Yes, please 
send me your uh, um, write to my mail and I will send you so our discussion will be more interesting. Right, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, go ahead, Archer. Now, fundamentally, we know we have four empires, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome. And we know Rome has two phases, pagan Rome and papal Rome. So what you asked me to say about those things is nothing to create a controversy over because those are just historical facts. The big issue is after we leave 1798, because the papacy came to an end in 1798, how do we place the King of the North in our time is a big issue. As we will say, next week will be the big issue. Now, what you must remember is this. The key factor is this, who controls Palestine? Now, the next regime after Papal Rome to control Palestine is the British Empire. And that's a fact. The British Empire controlled the whole territory and it was the British Empire that gave the Jews the right to return back to Palestine. So that is the phase we want to move into now. What happened after 1798? Which power is not regarded as the King of the North? And I want my friends to look at the book that is called A Word to the Little Flood, because there Ellen G. White and, and um, her husband comment on Daniel 11, 44 and 45. You must go and check out my friend, because that is where America is, bring, is brought onto the board. You know, America. Okay. Because Sorry, there's been a lot of talk about next week. And I just want to say, yeah. Eric has prepared a great presentation for next week. He came to his own conclusions, and it's going to be awesome. And I think you'll all be surprised. It's his thoughts. So we're not copying Uriah Smith. We're not copying Tim Rosenberg. This is an Eric Oltianu interpretation of the end of Daniel 11. I think you guys will and, love it. And, and, so and let's Brendan, wait to then. And, and I'm telling you, and I'm telling you, investigate a word to a little flock page eight and nine, because at that point, Ellen G. White made a comment, because we must bring a little inspiration to this thing, not just our ideas and talking and talking. Let us be led and guided by inspiration, right? So read that two pages there, eight and nine, word to a little flock and it will bring in the USA into the picture because that is the key. Because when the King of the North come to his end, that is the time says, at that time shall Michael stand up. That is critical point, <laughs> you know, critical point. When will Michael stand up is when the King of the North come to his end. Is that paper Rome, pagan Rome, or the USA coming to our end? So, so uh, I, uh, you're right about the spirit of prophecy. And I also want to point out that uh, Eric and I because these presentations are meant for a general audience, not just Adventists. So while we may not quote her directly, she is behind everything we say. We double check with everything to make sure it agrees with what she lines up. And, and most of the time, our words are just her paraphrases without directly referencing it. Um, so just, just so you know, we're, we're, we're not ignoring it. We're just uh, uh, being trying to, trying to be gracious to an audience who may not know uh, as much. Wonderful. Brother Ark, please, if you can, send to my mail. Your, this, uh, I have not this uh, book or uh, pages. Please send me. I, I will read it for okay. next time. So how do I get your email? Oh, On the screen. It's right. If, just look at his screen. It's janice.borse1 at gmail.com. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right, it is 9.07, everyone. It's, we're a little, like, almost 10 minutes over, um, but it was a really good discussion. Thank you so much for um, joining in. It was very lively, which is good. And thank you so much for Brandon and Eric for presenting. Looking forward to your next presentation. Um, and we'll be wrapping up the study of Daniel very soon. Um, we're going to meet this upcoming week to discuss the next steps of this ministry and what we should focus on next since... Um, we are finishing up Daniel. So we'll let you guys know when, when we come up with something. Um, we're going to have Eric close in prayer and then we will um, see you guys next week. All right, bye, Heather. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us and blessing us, from showing us the end of history from the time of Daniel. Uh, we pray that you will send your Holy Spirit to be with us on the Sabbath and this next upcoming week, Lord. Help us to be a rusty nail, and upon that nail, we pray that it will be a portrait of Jesus. 
help people not see us, but you in our daily interactions. Uh, guide us and bless us, and thank you everyone who was here tonight and those who couldn't make it. Bless each and every one of them in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.